Welcome and good morning and welcome to May, May the 2nd, 2021. Glad to see each of you here today and uh, before I get too far, uh, make sure that I just mentioned that uh, this week my uh, friend Drew Brads uh, and I spent a good chunk of a day just talking about a little bit about what we're going to talk about this morning, what we're going to learn about this morning. But uh, I'm just thankful to have somebody to, to bounce ideas off of and thoughts off of and concepts in Scripture. And uh, we've kind of got a, a, a large text to look at today. And uh, we will get through it as we come to focus on the Lord's Supper or communion that we're going to celebrate together here in a few minutes. So uh, if you can do two things, don't do it at once because you can't do two things at once. But if you can uh, grab your bulletins or a notebook that you bring with you to church and maybe there's a few notes that you can write down. There's an empty spot on your bulletin uh, and be wonderful if you uh, put some things down in writing that were new to you today or reminders to you today, or challenges to you. And then the other thing is, if you would uh, open up your Bibles to a text that I don't ever think was the text of a message ever before. I mean, I didn't scour all the archives and records, but if you would turn in your Bibles to the table of contents, please. The table of contents. Uh, we're going to launch from here. We won't study the table of contents in its uh, entirety. But if you would turn to the table of contents, and I don't know what page it's on. Some Bibles, these parts of the Bibles aren't even like numbered, right? But it's probably three or four pages in. And perhaps it looks something like this, the table of contents. And the table of contents tells us the contents of this book. There's 66 books in this collection of books. The word Bible has the idea of a collection of books. And uh, if you spend any time at all in your Bible, you probably know that there's two major divisions to the books of the Bible. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Any idea? what the Old Testament, why it's called the Old Testament, and why is the New Testament given the heading the New Testament? Okay, so perhaps like in the next two minutes, there's something that you're going to learn that you didn't really know. Now, this isn't the main point of the message. This isn't like the communion moment here, but we're going to build toward it. But... Uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament primarily in Greek, and uh, the, the word that is often translated in most of our translations of the Bible for covenant is the word testament, and in Old English writings, it's the word testament, and if you have a King James version of the Bible in many places in the Bible where in the NIV or the ESV it's translated covenant, the King James says testament. Okay, so the word testament and covenant are, are equivalent, but in our English language, the word testament has kind of changed. And like the only time I think I ever have thought of or used the word testament has to do with a will, right? Your final will, and testament. But other than that, we just don't use the word testament very often, but we do use the word covenant, and we have that understanding. So if you are one who likes to make notes in your Bible, perhaps a note you want to make right in the table of contents is the Old Testament, if we want to update the English there, it's really the writings of the Old Covenant, and the New Testament is really the collection of writings of the New Testament or the New Covenant. So if you don't really know what the 
the word testimony. You don't like that cross? Go ahead. You're welcome to do that in your table of contents. Just cross that out or put a little note there. What is this Old Testament? It's the information, the writings about the Old Covenant. The New Testament, the New Covenant. Now, what is a covenant? Uh, well, that run, we run into that in our culture uh, at weddings. A marriage covenant. It's an agreement, right? It's, it's this uh, set of, of vows that are recited. And if you agree to the arrangement of the covenant, you agree with, I will, or I do, right? And in a marriage covenant, that happens. And then in a marriage covenant, we have these different symbols or pictures to, to show that there are two people coming together in agreement and being united under the marriage covenant. And the way that it's shown is sometimes with a unity candle. Sometimes it's shown with sand that's mixed together and blended together and gives us that idea that it can never be separated or taken apart. Sometimes it's even salt that's mixed together and put together a salt covenant and it can never be separated. Another symbol of that marriage covenant that identifies who's, who's in that covenant is the ring, the wedding ring. That's a symbol of, that identifies, yes, I am a member. I am a part of that covenant, that agreement. Okay, so the idea of a covenant we still have in our, in our culture today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and you do, and you have your table of contents, the first book is the book of Genesis, and this, we're going to turn to Genesis 15 here just to get started. I want you to look here at Genesis 15. And I don't know if your Bible comes along with helpful little headings, but mine at Genesis 15 says God's covenant with Abram. Okay? I suppose in the Old English it would say God's testament with Abram. All right? God's testament, God's agreement, God's pact. If you... Uh, well, let's just start here at the first one. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham, Abram said, you have given me no children, so a, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. He said to them, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and is credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave you to this land to possess it. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these to him. He cut them in two and arranged them in halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the birds of prey came on the carcasses, but a Abraham drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And the Lord said to him, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared, a pass and pass between the pieces, and on that day the Lord made a testament, a covenant 
with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. God's promises will be true. Here's an agreement. Here's a covenant. Here's an example. And this is a really interesting one, but it will help us as we get to our next passage. Okay? God and Abraham have had this relationship and, and Abram has, has been trying to, like he's taken some steps of obedience and then there are steps backwards. And he's actually saying to God, how do I know that these promises are going to be true? How, and referring here to a birth of a son. God promised that one of your children will be in, in the line eventually leading the Messiah, the blessing to all the nations in, in Genesis chapter 12. How do I know this is going to be true? Well, in that ancient culture, apparently, there in the Middle East, they didn't use a unity candle. They didn't uh, necessarily mix the sand together. They did something much more dramatic, which to me would make weddings much more interesting. Okay? They brought animals, and they cut animals in half which would cause them to bleed, to die. They cut the animals in half. Okay, so I, uh, several years ago, uh, I was probably young and probably should not have done this, causing trauma to younger children. But I, I remember I was asked to, I think it was a chapel service. It might have been here. I can't remember. But it was with students. And I taught this passage. And I needed, I needed an animal, an illustration, right? And I knew it wouldn't be right to like, He's a real animal. So uh, we didn't have a whole lot of stuffed animals in our house, and the, the guns and basketballs wouldn't quite work for this illustration. But our next door neighbors had two girls and their family. And I said, Do you have any stuffed animal that, that, that you'd be willing to give to me? I won't return it, okay? Uh, it's not a loan. Do you have any? And I remember they gave me this beautiful black beaver, nice big beaver. And uh, of course, before that, chapel illustration I opened up the belly of the beaver and I filled it with ketchup oh, is that okay to do you think the chill I don't know if any of you were there as children did you have you recovered from that but they're in counseling but what happened you know there it is the beaver gets cut in half and there's just ketchup everywhere there's blood everywhere and what did the people in the agreement in the Middle East do in that covenant moment? They put these animals side by side, these, these halves of these animals, these bloody animals, and they said to show that this agreement, this covenant, this testament, that we're all in it, we're all in, is together we're going to walk between these bloody animals, and as we walk between them, we're going to be reminded that if I fail in my agreement to you, may what's right there happen to me. The blood will be on me. It's my life. That's how serious this covenant is. That would make weddings interesting, right? Right? That would make them very interesting. But that's the seriousness of this covenant. If you go to the second book, Exodus, and go to chapter 19. There's another mention of a covenant. And Exodus chapter 19, we are now out of Egypt. And Moses is leading the children of Israel. And a nation is going to be established here. And in order to have a nation, there needs to be some agreement that the people in a nation will hold to, will keep. And so a part of Exodus 19 and on through Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy is God giving the people the constitution or the agreement or the compact that if you are going to be a part of this nation... Here's the rules. Here's, here's what we're going to be about. And so this is happening here in, in Exodus 19, verse 3. 
Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord God called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you out to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, my testament, if you keep my agreement, if you keep my pact, right, then out of all the nations... You will be my treasured possession. Now, there's a whole lot more to this agreement or pact, but, but if we just stop with this little piece, God told Moses, tell the people that if you follow everything in this agreement, everything in this covenant, everything in this testament, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. There'll be this special relationship between God and a nation called Israel. If you follow the laws, if you follow what you're supposed to as a member of this nation, then I will be your God and you will be my people. There's this relationship established right there. So this is like the, a revealing of a covenant that extends out through the whole rest of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is primarily books written about God dealing with the children of Israel based upon this agreement that he made with him. Now Genesis up to this point is giving the context to where this covenant's going to come in that but this is what we would refer to now as the Old Covenant. Now, they didn't see it that way. This was the covenant, right? This was the covenant that God made with them. To go over to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. So we're still in the second book of the Old Testament. We're still talking about the Old Covenant in here in the Old Testament. And in Exodus 24... We read this in verse 1. Let's just start there. He said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll uh, encounter these individuals a little bit later, but uh, Moses, the leader of Israel, Aaron, the high priest, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, and then the 70 other leaders. You are to worship at a distance. Verse 2 of Exodus 24. But Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. Then Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws. So Moses met with God. God communicated to Moses what this new covenant, the New Testament, the new arrangement was going to be with Israel. All right? We skipped that past Exodus 20. Anybody remember Exodus 20? The Ten Commandments, right? That was part of God's agreement with the children of Israel. No other gods. I'm the Lord your God. No graven images. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't covet. Sabbath day, right? The Ten Commandments are all there. That's part of this. So Moses... Verse 3, went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, and they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. So God set up this covenant, this agreement, this arrangement, and said, here's the rules for the children of Israel. Here's the rules for this new nation. And, the, and Moses read it to the people. And they said, we'll do it. We want to join in with this agreement with God. We'll do it. And by saying that, what are they saying here? Everything the Lord has said, we will do. We will be obedient. We'll do everything. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. 
Moses took half of the blood. I don't know if this is a, is a, is a reminder to the people about the halves of the animals in, earlier in Genesis. But he took half of the blood and put it in bowls and the other half he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant. What's that? The laws of the nation that so far have been revealed to the people. He took the book of the covenant and he read it to the people and they responded a second time. We will do everything the Lord has says. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So in that ancient world in the Middle East, when a covenant was made, it was often sealed with blood, marked with blood. There has to be at least two people involved in the covenant. Some of the blood was put on the altar representing God's presence because the children of Israel were coming into a covenant relationship with God. And then Moses, when the people said, I do, like in a wedding, right? I will. When the people agreed to that and said, we will obey everything God said, would the rest of the blood go? Moses sprayed it out, sprinkled it out, threw it out on the people. And it landed on them. What was going through their minds when that blood was on them? If we fail to keep our end of the agreement, our life's on the line. It's that serious. This is a blood covenant, a blood pact. They were that serious about it and as Moses threw that blood out there, here's God's part of the deal. Here's your part of the deal. If you really believe this, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Well, we're going to put our lives on the line. So this covenant that God made with his people is an agreement between God and his people saying if we don't keep the laws of the land, if we don't obey them, then may death come on me. May I be cursed. All right? If we break this blood covenant, it's death. It's death. Reminds me of uh, what we read later in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. When God's laws are disobeyed, it makes sense that there should be death because that's the agreement that God made with his people and that's the agreement that God's people, God's nation of Israel made with God. We're in on this with you, God. We're in on this with you. And if we disobey, we understand the earning of disobeying, the wages of disobeying, is death. In Exodus 24, though, we keep reading, and uh, if you would just go down to uh, verse 9 of Exodus 24. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel under his feet were something like pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. This is, this is just one of those things that uh, it's one of those, whoa, wow. What's going on here? Well, there was an agreement that the people made and now the people's representatives 
were allowed to go up a mountain and in some way they were able to eat a meal with some some representation of God. Some believe that maybe they saw it were with a meal and that meal was with Jesus in the flesh. Some think that maybe they saw just the, the footstool of God or, or just a glimpse of him because no one could see God in all of his glory and survive, right? But what's another part that comes with an agreement or a covenant? Hey, we're in this together. We're in this together, God and the people. What better way to celebrate that and show that but let's eat together. Let's eat together. Let's have a meal. Let's show that we're having community. Let's come together and just have fellowship together, a meal together. And so Moses and these other leaders of Israel were invited to a meal after this covenant was made. So we're just going to stop right there because we also know there's a part of our Bible called the New Testament, the New Covenant. And here's the amazing thing about the New Covenant. And there's a gazillion facets of it. And we're only going to look at one in the next couple of minutes that's going to lead us to the Lord's table. We're only going to look at one. Where would you find the other facets of the New Covenant? In the New Testament? But here's the one I want us to think about in the next couple of moments. We've sinned against God. We've broken the law. We've not honored God with our choices. And our lives are on the line and we deserve death. For the wages of sin is death. However, here's the one little aspect of the new covenant I want you to get. We sinned, but Jesus' blood was spilled in our place. We should have died but instead he died. That's a part of what made this a brand new covenant. In the old covenant, the person who sins deserves death. And then God added to that with all the animals and the sacrifices as a covering, as a temporary thing. But we sin, we deserve death. But instead, Jesus died in our place. The blood should be on us and splattered on us and we should be dying. And instead, Jesus died for us. In Matthew 26, where Jesus is meeting with his disciples and, and celebrating the Passover meal, the night that he was betrayed, says this, then Jesus took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant. My blood. It should be our blood. It should be our death. But Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant. In Mark 14, Jesus again is the Passover meal. And it says a very similar thing. Jesus is eating with his disciples and he says in Mark 14, 24, this is my blood of the covenant. Again, it should be our blood. It should be our death. And Jesus says, no, it's my blood. In Luke 22, 
The Passover meal is again described by Luke. And it says this, In the same way after supper, he, Jesus, took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant, the New Testament, the new way in my blood. That's very different than the person who sins, who breaks the covenant. It should be their blood that's spilt. They deserve the penalty of death. And Jesus says, no, it's in my blood. My blood is spilt for you. If we finish Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. If you want to write down just a few references here, write down a few. I'm going to read through a few here. What are some of the terms of this New Testament covenant? Well, one aspect of it is this, that Jesus died in our place. We broke the covenant. We broke the laws. But he died for us. So in Galatians 1, verses 3 and 4, Got about six of these. If you just want to write a few of these down and look at them later. Galatians 1, 3 and 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. It should be us dying for our sins, but he gave himself for our sins. To rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Or Galatians 2.20. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, in Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. It should be me dying because of my sin. But Jesus gave himself for me. The blood is his blood. Not mine. Isaiah 53, 5. This is Isaiah writing during the time of the Old Covenant, giving the people a little glimpse of the future New Covenant. He says this about the coming Savior. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace, a relationship that made us God's people, was on Him. By His wounds, we are healed. Do you get all that? Jesus did it for us. We're healed because of what He has done. He was crushed for our iniquities. The old covenant, we would be crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. No, the sinner should be pierced, right? But Jesus did it for us. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. He bore our sins. It should be us. But he did it for us. 1 Peter 3.18 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. He suffered for our sins. And we should have been suffering for our sins to bring us to God. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
And what was so alarming for the disciples as they ate that Passover meal with Jesus was they entered it with a complete understanding of the old covenant. And Jesus says, there's something new. It's my blood. It's not the blood of all the sacrifices. And it's not your life anymore. It's my blood. That's something new. That's something very different. And just like that old covenant back in Exodus, the people said we're in. How do we get into this new covenant? How do we get into this new agreement with God? Well, we realize that we've broken God's laws. We realize that we deserve death. And instead, Christ died for us. And we put our faith and our belief that what he has done for us is his grace to us. We didn't deserve it. We should be pierced. We should be bruised. It should be our blood that's built, and instead he did it for us. So that first covenant, the old covenant, what did they do after the covenant was made and the people came into agreement with God? God invited them to a meal. They got to eat and drink with God. And today, we're invited to a meal. And we get to eat and drink with God. And who gets to do that? Those who have entered into the covenant. Those who have agreed with God's terms. And the really, 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 really sad thing is a lot of people still choose to earn their way and hope that that works. And I hope I'm good enough and I think I'm good enough. And if I look at some really bad people around me, then I know I'm good enough. God will let me into heaven. I'll be able to be, have a relationship with him. And they're missing this free gift of grace. For Jesus has just come believe in me that I have died for you. So who gets to come to the table? Those who have made that decision. Those who have signed that agreement and made that covenant, that testament official. I'm going to ask Grayson and Jacqueline to come up. And uh, I want to give us a few moments to just think through. Have you entered into this agreement with God on God's terms? How can people's hearts be so hard that they don't see the grace of Jesus? Oh, Holy Spirit, soften our hearts and help us to see that there's a free gift right there. A free gift. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is because of Jesus' blood. So take some time to, to talk with God and in a moment I'll invite you to stand up and those of you that have made entered into the new covenant, you can go to the tables and pick it up, but I'll let you know when to do that. So just let's pray quietly for a moment. <laughs>